Hey there, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here uh, with uh, today's weekly prophetic word. I'm excited about the word as always, so let's jump right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you just thanking you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to serve you, O oh God, another opportunity to come into your presence. I ask you to fill me with the Holy Ghost, O oh God. I surrender my mind, my, my brain, my words, O oh God, my body. Uh, my, my hand motions, everything, oh God, I surrender to the filling of the Holy Ghost and I ask you to take control. Let uh, the word spoken be what you want to be spoken, oh God, that you might be glorified in all things and that the saints might be edified and that what you want to go forth might go forth. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. And thank you for another opportunity to serve you and be a part of your kingdom. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, <clears throat> let's jump right in. Today's prophetic word is expectations or great expectations, okay? Expectations or great expectations. Now, we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture, um, but hopefully we can glean some new insights and uh, show you some things that you haven't seen before. Remember that this is prophetic teaching. It's prophetic teaching. It's prophecy based on a word I got from the Lord, and we're going to listen to the Holy Ghost as we go, but it's also uh, exegetical. I'm looking at the word says, and we're gleaning some nuggets from the word of God, and we're looking at the original language. So it's prophetic teaching. It's just not straight prophesying. It's not just straight teaching. It's prophetic teaching, okay? Now, Ephesians 3.20, uh, Ephesians is in the New Testament. It is what we call one of the Pauline epistles, and the reason we call it that is because the Apostle Paul wrote it, uh, and remember that the Apostle Paul was once Saul of Tarsus. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was a killer of Christians, and he spent his life, uh, his adult career, trying to stop the spread of Christianity, and then one day he met the Lord face to face, and Jesus called him and told him who he was. And Saul of Tar Tarsus became Paul, Paul the Apostle. And he ended up writing uh, 75, 80% of the New Testament. That's this man, okay? And the reason it's called Ephesians is because it was written to a church of believers in a city named Ephesus. Okay, a city named Ephesus, that's why it's called Ephesians. It's a letter that Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in the city of Ephesus. That's why it's called Ephesians. Okay? All right, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. In the King James Bible, that says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. In the Berean Study Bible, it says, Now to him who is able to do infinitely more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. And as I said, today's uh, prophetic word is expectations and or great expectations. So it says, again in the scripture, now to him who is able, okay? Let's look up that phrase, is able. It is from the Greek word dunamai, okay? Dunamai, or dunamai, excuse me, dunamai, and it says to be able to have power. I am powerful, I have the power. I am able, I can. It says, so God has the power, he's able, he can to do. Now, in the Brian Study Bible, the next word is infinitely, he, or in the uh, King James Bible, it says exceedingly or abundantly. So that word infinitely is the word Hooper in Greek and means over, beyond, and figuratively, figuratively on behalf of, or for the sake of, or concerning. So when it says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly, all the more than all we ask or think, or infinitely more than we ask or imagine, that means He has the power to do over, over and abundantly anything that we can think of, or imagine, or dream about according to his power that is at work within us. So then that begs a question. If that's true, and we know that it is true because it's in the word, it begs a question that if that's the case, why don't all Christians have that? Why aren't all Christians walking in that? 
because you know that all saints, all believers, all people that claim the name of Christ aren't all walking in that. Why? Okay. And the answer to that question is the title of today's prophetic word. It's because of your expectations. Uh, the scripture says he's able to do infinitely more than we all ask or imagine. Now, in your mind right now, in your head, there's a movie playing. And that movie playing has to do with the state of your life, past, present, and future. Now, whether you're uh, more naturally introspective or not, you still look at that movie on a fairly regular basis, okay? And how do I know that? I know that because when you get in relationships, what causes the arguments? All arguments come from the same place, okay? Let me say that again. All arguments come from the exact same place, and that place is a clash of expectations. Either somebody did something that you didn't expect them to do, or somebody didn't do something that you did expect them to do. And that's what caused the argument. Again, all arguments come from a clash of expectations. Something happened that you didn't expect to happen, or something didn't happen that you did expect to happen. <clears throat> that's how I know there's a movie playing in our heads about the state of our lives. And when you engage in your self-talk, you're looking at that movie. And Bishop Jake says most of the time, we're looking at the past. But one way or another, when you talk to yourself, you're looking at that movie. You might be replaying yesterday. You might be replaying 10 years ago. You might be replaying childhood. But you're replaying something. It's my water bottle popping. You're replaying something because you're looking at that movie of your life, past, present, and future. And when you look at the future portions, it's how you expect your life to play out. Okay? Those are your expectations. And when you get in a, a, a marriage relationship, everything you thought about how your marriage is going to be comes rushing to the surface. Let me say that again. Everything you thought about how your marriage was going to be comes rushing to the surface. It never fails. As soon as the man or woman of God says, I now pronounce you uh, husband and wife, then everything you think is supposed to happen comes rushing to the surface. And that's why times are good or times are bad, because your spouse ain't acting the way you thought <laughs> they were going to act. Because I don't care what anybody says, you have a bunch of expectations, okay? Sometimes in life, things can happen, and we say, why, God, why? Sometimes we get blindsided. Sometimes we go through things like Job, where it looks like just it's just a devil everywhere, and it just comes out of nowhere. Well, you didn't expect that to happen, and that's why sometimes we get mad at God. Sometimes we get disillusioned. Sometimes we slow our, our whole motion down. Sometimes we get bitter. Sometimes we determine that we're not going to forgive and we carry everything forward. Well, all that's because you didn't expect what happened. You didn't expect that to happen. Or you're saying, well, that wasn't supposed to happen to me. So you've got a movie playing in your head, whether you, you realize it or not, and whether you consciously pay attention to it a lot or not, you do. And so when the Bible says he's able to do infinitely more than all we can ask or imagine, we do still have to do both of those things. We do still have to both ask and we have to imagine. Okay? You know why? Because all of that works by faith. What is it that you're expecting? What is it that you're expecting God to do? Okay? Now I'm going to give you two different kind of levels. One level is, do you have a general mindset of victory? Do you believe Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good for those that love the Lord and the call according to his purpose? Do you believe that if you're a Christian, no matter what the scenes of your life are, no matter what happens to come your way, God is going to Romans 8 and 28 it. And before it's all said and done, that thing is going to work together for your good. Do you believe that? So that's like the general thing. And then, because, you know, people quote that scripture a lot, um, Romans 8, 28. And then there's the specific thing. 
the specific thing or specific things are things that you personally are hoping for, believing, believing for, uh, praying about. And these are things that you think about every day. These are the desires of your heart. Do you really expect them to happen? Do you really expect them to come to pass? Because the Bible says to inherit the promises of God, it requires faith and patience. As a matter of fact, I'm going to look that scripture up so I can show you where that is. Faith and patience. That is Hebrews 6 and 12. And it says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Uh, that was King James. In the Berean Study Bible, it says, then you will not be sluggish, but will imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. That is Hebrews 6 and 12. So the Bible tells you how you get the promises of God. You get them through faith, which is believing, but faith is also a substance. Faith is not just believing, but faith is a substance. It's a spiritual substance, like hope is a spiritual substance and love is a spiritual substance. Okay? It lives in the spiritual realm and it lives in your spirit. Because you can't go to Target and get a six-pack of hope. You can't go to Walmart and get a gallon of love. And you can't go to Aldi and buy a box of faith. They're spiritual substances. Okay, but they're real. They live in the spiritual world and they live in your spirit. So the Bible says that you, uh, it says not to be sluggish or slow for or lazy, but you inherit uh, God's promises through faith and patience. So you got to have faith, you got to believe, and you got to use the substance that pulls from the invisible to the visible. And it says you got to be patient. That it's not just going to all, you know, pop in overnight. Now, what's one of the best examples of that in the Bible? One of the best examples of that in the Bible is, of course, Abraham. Abraham and Sarah, they started out as Abram and Sarai. And then God changed their names by adding the H uh, in Hebrew, that's the Hebrew breath mark. So he went from Abram to Abraham, Abraham, and she went from Sarai to Sarah, Sarah, okay? That means that God literally breathed on them, okay? And God signified that or gave a sign of that by changing the name to Abraham or Sarah because God breathed on them. Well, when God first called Abram to go out, uh, he called him to leave his family and go out to a land that he was going to show him. And then God promised Abraham he was going to make him the father of many nations. When all that took place, starting out, Abram was 75 years old and Sarai was 65 years old. They didn't have Isaac until Abraham was 100 years old. <laughs> That's 25 years later. 25 years later. 25 years later, and God did it that way on purpose, because if they had had Isaac any, at any point in life where they could have conceived him naturally, then God would, would not have gotten any glory. It would have been a natural baby. It would not have been a miracle. It would not have looked like a miracle. But they, God waited until both their bodies were dead, until Sarai had gone through menopause. She had stopped having her cycle. It's, the Bible says it ceased to be with her, uh, you know, for the manner of women, so that's menopause. And Abraham, uh, the, the Bible says his body was now dead. It didn't work. So God waited until everything for them reproductively was over and, and breathed on them, changed their names, and gave them the ability to have a baby. But it was 25 years later. 25 years later, when God showed Abraham, he told him to look up and look at the stars, and he told him to look at the sand on the beach, and God said, I'm going to make your family like that. I'm going to make your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the beach. But it was 25 years later when they actually had Isaac. You see that? So they inherit that promise through faith and patience. They had to wait a quarter of a century for it to come to pass. Okay? So the Bible tells us how we get it. But in looking at expectations or great expectations, we're talking about specifically what's playing in that movie. 
So there's the general level of victory we're supposed to expect in Romans 8, 28. But then there's uh, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires of your heart? What is it that you've always dreamed about? Think back to when you were a little child. Now, if you're living your dream, you don't have to think back because you're in it. But uh, even if you are, maybe there's still some things you want to have in. But think back to how you dreamed when you were a kid and you said, when I grow up, I want to be. You said, when I grow up, I want to do. When I grow up, I want this to happen. I want that to happen. Are you living in that? Are you walking in that? Because the Bible says that God is able to do infinitely more. So in other words, wherever the ceiling is in your mind, God can do more than that times forever. <laughs> Let me say that again. The Bible says that wherever the ceiling is in your mind, more than we all, more than all we ask or imagine, and we can imagine some pretty big stuff, okay? So whatever you've asked God and whatever you can imagine, the Bible says wherever that ceiling is, whatever that top is, in your mind, God is able to do more than that times infinity. So in other words, there actually isn't a ceiling on God's ability or his power. So that's why expectations are so important, because maybe you're putting a limit on God. Maybe you're putting a limit on his power. Maybe you're putting a limit. Maybe there's a ceiling playing in your mind. And if there is, then that's why the power of God is not activating in the fullness in your life. Because you're putting a ceiling, you're putting a limit, or maybe you don't really believe, or maybe you haven't been patient, maybe you haven't been doing it long enough to inherit the promises. But the main thing we want to look at is, is what are your expectations? What does that movie look like? Do you believe, uh, did you believe, and do you believe that everything is, is going to happen overnight? I'll give you another practical example, because you know I like to give practical examples. Um, find a couple that's been married over 20 or 25 years. Find a couple that has at least 20 years under their belt, 20 years of marriage, okay? And ask them if they have a good relationship, how they got there. They will tell you without exception that it's a lot of work, <laughs> okay? And they will also tell you something very interesting. They will tell you that whatever relationship they have today, the relationship that you see, the relationship that you might want for your marriage, they didn't always have that relationship. They didn't start out that way. If they're being honest, excuse me, they'll tell you that they did not start out that way. Whatever relationship they have now, they built it. And excuse me, and it took them two decades to get to where they are now. Two decades of being married, 20 years or more of being married to build, to build to the relationship they have now. And a lot of people will tell you that it takes them their whole marriage to get to the relationship they, that they really wanted. That's not what they thought when they were young and started out because that's not what anybody thinks when they're young and starting out. When people are young and starting out, especially if you get married still in the infatuation phase, you think it's always going to be the way it was in the beginning and you're always going to feel the way you felt, okay? And that's not true. You're going to go through many seasons, and the longer you stay with the same person, the more seasons you're gonna go through, okay? So uh, the point I'm making there is that what are your expectations? They didn't expect it would take them 20 years to get to where they wanted to go. They probably didn't expect it would take them years at all because every, when everything starts out, when you get married in the infatuation phase, Everything is great, okay? So my point, my focus here is to show you what's going on in that movie. Are you obsessed with the past? When that movie comes up, now there's nothing wrong with, you know, looking at the past. Some people say, you know, they don't look back. Everybody looks back on some level. But I'm talking about are you obsessed with the past? Uh, do you expect life to play out in the future the way it has in the past. Now, that's a mistake I made. I made that mistake uh, a while back. I was looking things and I was talking to the Lord and I was 
thinking about some things and I had been through some very rough situations, especially in my childhood. And as I looked into the future, I was really kind of pessimistic because I thought that things were going to be like they'd always been, okay? And I discovered that, that God was willing and God had to work with me and God had to work with my mind and God had to work with my expectations to teach me and show me that he was both willing and able to do something new in my life, something that did not look like what had already been. But I stopped by to tell you it didn't happen until I believed it. It wasn't that the Lord didn't say it, and it wasn't that the Lord wasn't willing, and it wasn't that the Lord wasn't able. None of that was the problem. The problem was my mindset. The problem was that when I looked into my future at that point in my life, I thought my future was going to be just like my past, and I didn't believe it. So God had to walk with me. God had to talk with me. God had to work with me. God had to work with my faith, but also with my imagination, with my mindset to get me to a point where I believed, I believed I could have a future that was not reflective of my past at all, that I could uh, walk in something and create something through faith and through belief and through obeying God that didn't look anything like what I'd seen so far. And it took me a while to get there because I was so fixated on the experiences of my past. Now, I share that to say that might be your situation, too. You might have been through some stuff that has so marked you in the mind, so marked you in the head that you keep thinking life can't get any better. Life can't be any different. Life is not going to unfold any differently for me than it has in the past. And you might be rigid and you need some lucidity. You need some flexibility. You need to open. You need to open your mind. You need to open your soul. You need to open your heart. But you say, Prophet Taylor, there's too much pain there. If I'm going to try and open all those things, all I get is pain. Then that means you have to lift those things up to the Lord and let him heal them so that you can dream again. That's right, because pain is a dream killer. And if you have too much pain, it can snuff out your hope. And if you have too much pain, it can make your expectations negative and pessimistic. Okay? And if you have too much pain, uh, it can also be accompanied by fear. And you say, well, I don't want to hope again, and I don't want to dream again, because I don't want to get hurt again. And that's something that the devil really loves to do to us humans. It's something that the devil really loves to do to people. He likes to get you so hurt, so afraid, so angry, and so bitter that you stop hoping, that you stop dreaming, that you think the things he's put you through for a season is all there is to living. Uh, you think that... <clears throat> Like, right before you live your dream, you might have lived your nightmare, like Job. Like the worst things, your worst fear might have happened. Things you didn't want to happen might have happened. And I've been through uh, almost all of my worst fears. I, I've been through all of them. Okay, they all happened. And so, and so the devil will work very hard. He will work overtime <clears throat> to try and convince you that when you are going through a season or when you've been through a season of testing and tribulation or a season of great tribulation. Because sometimes we go through tribulation and sometimes we go through great tribulation. The devil wants to convince you that that's all there is to life. That it's never going to be any better. It's never going to be any different. And that's why so many people emerge from seasons like that, bitter. Because they're going to hold on to the pain. They're going to hold on to what happened. And then sometimes, again, that that holding on to the pain is out of fear. Like, I don't want to be hurt again. I don't want to go through that again, so I'm not going to try, so just forget it. If that's the case, you need to open up all those areas in your soul to God so that he can heal them, and that's going to be painful. But when the Lord gets through working with it, his salve, his balm, his ointment, 
his love, his truth is going to heal that pain in your soul. Uh, as they say, I'm a living witness. That's why I'm sitting up here prophesying now. That's why I'm sitting up here teaching now because the Lord healed me. Okay? And he's got to heal that pain in your soul to show you that you can indeed have a life that's different from uh, what you had in the past. That's better than what you had in the past. And you can indeed live your dream. That he will indeed give you the desires of your heart. Okay? But God has to heal Okay, your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and he's got to heal your heart, not just your blood pump, but also the center of all your emotions, and then your inner man, the center of all your belief and expectations. As the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's not just talking about your blood pump. That's the physical manifestation, but deep down inside, in your inner man, you have uh, a housing, you have a a repository, you have a depository, you have a seat of all your emotions. You have something inside your spirit that feeds your brain. Because the Bible doesn't say, as a man thinketh in his mind, so is he. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, that means your heart can think. That means your heart has a movie screen. And that movie screen is feeding your brain. It's feeding your mind up here. And that picture and those pictures have to be healthy. They have to be positive. They have to uh, be optimistic. And they have to be detailed. Okay? Why do they have to be all those things? Because if you're not positive and optimistic and full of faith, if you don't really believe it can happen and it's going to happen, then it won't. Number one, but number two, uh, uh, think about a house. Think about building a house. You can't ever build a house without a blueprint. Think about it. You can't just throw a house up. You got to have some kind of blueprint. And not only do you have a blueprint, blueprint, you have a specific blueprint. Okay, that house has a specific height and a specific shape and a specific number of floors and a specific number of rooms, and specifically how big are each of those rooms, and how many bathrooms do you have? Do you have a half bath? Do you have a full bath? And where is the kitchen? And how big is the kitchen? And all that different kind of stuff. You can't ever just kind of randomly throw a house together. You have to have not just a blueprint. You have to have a specific blueprint. So you build a specific house. It looks like what you thought in your head. So to bring the house out here and make the house that you want to live in live out here, that's going to come from a specific blueprint that has to do with creating that specific house. Well, that's the way your expectations have to be with God. So as I talked about before, there's the general expectation we're supposed to have as believers found in, in Romans 8 and 28, that we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and the called according to his purpose, okay? What we wish that verse said was, all things feel good. <laughs> all things feel good to them that love the Lord and the called according to his purpose. That's what we wish that verse said. But what it actually says is that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and the called according to his purpose. Now, don't get that twisted. I have seen people try to claim that scripture and they not say. <laughs> you can't claim God's promises if you're not in covenant with him. So if anybody's looking at this video and you are an unbeliever, the way God works is by covenant or agreement, by contract. And that's something you can understand. Okay, if you want a loan from the bank, you have to get a contract for that. When you get married, you sign a marriage contract. <clears throat> when you go to university, you sign a contract with the university. When you get hired for a new job, there's a contract that you sign. Well, that is the way the kingdom of God works. That's the way God works. That's why a lot of people get mad at God. A lot of sinners and a lot of unbelievers get mad at God because they think that his promises just extend to humanity automatically, and that's not the truth. That's not the truth. 
You can't claim God's promises if you are not in contract or in covenant with him because that's how they work. And that's why you need to get saved. You need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And then the covenant or the contract or the testament, in other words, like Jesus' last will and testament, like when somebody dies, the testament of Jesus then comes into your life and then all the promises in the testament, the contract, you have access to those now before Father God in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are only for believers. Those are only for people that are born again. And if you are not a Christian, if you are not saved, if you're not born again, you are out there against the devil and against life on your own. That's why the devil can just walk up to you and take you out. Why do you think so many people just get taken out just suddenly, just no explanation? Because that doesn't happen to the saints. Death don't just come upon the saints. Okay? Things don't just happen to you when you're a believer, when you're a Christian. There's nothing that happens in your life that God is not, not already aware of. Okay? But if you're an unbeliever, if you don't have a covenant or a contract with God, you can't claim his promises. And I've seen people on TV try to say, well, you know, all things work together for good. That's for saints. That's for Christians. That's for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a general blanket promise to humanity because it doesn't work that way. Okay? And if something tragic has happened in your life and you're a sinner and you're an unbeliever, that was the devil. Okay? Because you're out there against him uncovered. You got no covenant promises with God. You got no contract. You got no armor. You're just out there. So right now I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to show you how to get born again. I'm going to show you uh, how to come to Christ. And the way you get born again is A, B, C. A, you admit that you're a sinner. Okay? You admit to God that you are a sinner. B, you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Son of the true and living God that he came from heaven through the womb of a woman, through Mary, was born, lived, and died on the cross for your sins and was resurrected the third day for your new life. And C, you confess that with your mouth. You confess what you just said and B, what you believe. So A, B, C, you admit that you are a sinner, you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you confess all that with your mouth. And this is the prayer you pray. You say, God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. I sin. I'm a sinner. But I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is your son and that he came from heaven to live and die and be resurrected uh, from the grave and die on the cross for my sins. And I now confess that with my mouth, that I'm a sinner. But I believe that Jesus came to save me. So please come into my heart and save me. Thank you for saving me. And you are born again, just like that. That's right. That's right. It's that easy because the Lord did the work. All you have to do is ABC. Admit you're a sinner, believe on Jesus, and confess with your mouth while you believe in your heart. That's right. So if you just did that, welcome to the family. Welcome to the promises and the covenant of God. If you didn't do that and you don't believe it, I strongly, strongly encourage you to become born again and to get right with God so that you can claim and walk in his promises. Because if you don't have a covenant with God, you can't claim them. Okay? So to conclude our lesson for the day, <clears throat> the Bible says that whatever is going on in the movie plan in our head and whatever prayers we've prayed, whatever we ask God, he has the power to do super above that times infinity. So in other words, there's no ceiling on God's power. There's no ceiling on what he's able to do. So again, the question then becomes, why don't all Christians have that? And the answer to that question is, it's because of your expectations. It's because of the movie playing in your head. What does that movie look like? We're supposed to have Romans 8.28, a general expectation of victory of all things working together for our good. But we're also supposed to have Psalm 37 and 4. What are the desires of your heart? Because to build a house, you've got to have a specific blueprint. What is it that you des desire on the level of specificity? 
Do you want to go back to school? Do you want to go to school for the first time? What school do you want to go to? What kind of degree do you want? Uh, do you want to get married? When do you want to get married? To whom do you want to get married? You know, what kind of person is the right kind of person for you? Do you want to buy a new house? Do you want to move into a house? Do you want to build a dream house? Do you want to build a business? What kind of business? Okay. And let me throw in right there that I'm building, I'm living my dream. Remember, I always tell you that there's nothing that I preach and teach that I'm not living myself. There's nothing I would tell you to do that I'm not doing. I'm uh, working on things. I was just working on my comic book yesterday, The Nephilim Wars, and I worked on it on and off all day because it just makes me so happy. I was working on a dialogue, working on the script uh, to get some of the lettering done, and I'm looking at the, the comic book pages, and I'm looking at the word bubbles and who's going to say what and what they're going to say. And that just tickles me because I love it. <laughs> because I've loved comic books since I was a very little boy. And now I'm making my own. Um, excuse me, I'm an author. I'm writing children's books. Um, got some more sci-fi books that I'm going to drop before the summer's out. Uh, I mean, so I'm out there doing it. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> so that's what I mean when I say, and you hear me say it all the time, that I'm not preaching and teaching anything that I'm not living. Anything I'm telling you to do, I'm doing it. Okay? But God had to work with me to get me to the point where the movie playing in my head was the right one, where my expectations were along the lines of him being able to do all the things I had dreamed about, him to being able exceedingly or abundantly to do more than I can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't get it, because it's your faith that activates that power. If the activation of the power of God and the will of God for your life was automatic, that means that every Christian would instantly be walking in the perfect will of God the day you got born again. And we know that's not true, okay? You have to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. You have to surrender your body to God, a living sacrifice, okay? You have to press into the kingdom of God, okay? You have to press into God's presence. You have to press to get into what God has for you, and you're not going to press if you don't believe there's something there worth having, okay? It's why Jesus died. Jesus died because he didn't want to die, and the first thing Father God told him was that he didn't have to die. He had it out, Father God told Jesus he, in the Garden of Gethsemane that he would send him angels to rescue him and deliver him from the cross if he didn't want to go. So why did Jesus voluntarily, why did the Lord come up saying, not my will but thine be done? The answer to that question is because Father God showed Jesus everything he was going to give him if he died. The name above every name, the crown of crowns, the diadem, making him king of kings and lord of lords giving him the keys of hell and death, giving him a scepter or a rod of iron to rule the nations, making all his enemies become his footstool, where Jesus could sit down at the right hand of the Father because his work was finished. And he showed him his friends, Peter, James, and John, and all the people that he loved while he was alive on earth as a man. And Father God also showed him all of us. He gave Jesus a picture of the future where the Lord could see all the people that were going to have eternal life because of his sacrifice. That's why Jesus died, if you didn't know that. That's why Jesus came up saying, not my will, meaning he's talking to his father, not my will, Father God, but thine be done. That's why Jesus said that, and that's why he made the decision, because God showed him in the Garden of Gethsemane all the things Jesus was going to inherit and all the things he was going to get if he voluntarily chose to go to the cross, because the Lord made it clear was his choice. When they came to arrest Jesus, he said, I'm he, and they all fell backwards. And the Lord was demonstrating that he was in control of the situation. He was demonstrating that he had power in the situation. When Pilate basically told Jesus, don't you know who I am? Jesus kind of laughed and said, I could call my father right now, and he'd give me 12 legions of angels. Okay, so the Lord had an out, if you didn't know that. Okay, the Lord did not go kicking and screaming to the cross. And they didn't arrest Jesus because they overpowered him, because they didn't. He made a choice, and he demonstrated all through along what we call the passion of the Christ. 
his arrest, his trial, his whipping, his beating, his scourging, and his crucifixion. He demonstrated that he was in control at all times. It was a choice he made because Jesus died for precisely six hours. They put him on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning, and he died precisely at three o'clock. He said, it is finished, three o'clock p.m. He said, it is finished, bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. He was in control of how long he died, and he was in control of when he died. Okay? So he did that because Father showed him all the things he was going to get if he voluntarily went to the cross, all that he was going to inherit. And part of that was showing Jesus us, all the people that would come to be saved because of his sacrifice from our point of view in time over 2,000 years ago. That's something else, man. Well, if Father did it for Jesus, we're in Jesus. So that means he'll do it for us. He'll show you all the things he wants to give you and bless you with and the life you can have that will be a blessing to people that you won't live to see be born if you believe it. Because you're not going to have that life if you don't believe it. I showed you the scripture before, uh, Hebrews 6 and 12, that you inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. You've got to believe it, and there's going to be a time element. You're going, time element. You're going to have to work at it over time. Okay, that's why the Bible also says that faith that our works is dead. In other words, believing God does not mean just sitting around, you know, just sitting and doing nothing. You got to be doing stuff. You got to be chasing it. And you're not going to be out there chasing your dream if you don't really believe that it can happen. Okay, so I encourage you today to have great expectations, not just expectations, but great expectations. I encourage you and I challenge you to look at that picture that's playing in your head and let God heal it. Let God replace whatever's hurt inside of your soul with health. As the scripture says, beloved, I, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, that you would let God work on that picture so that picture can be healthy. And then you'll be amazed at the kind of stuff you can accomplish if you believe that you can, if you believe that God's going to bless it, if you believe that the Lord's going to work it out. Okay? All right. So uh, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. And if I don't uh, see it while you put it up there, then I will pray for it later. Sometimes I don't always see uh, the prayer requests as they were, uh, scroll on the screen. That's on both Facebook and Periscope. So if I don't, if I don't respond, um, it's because I didn't see it. So please put it up there. And if I don't pray for it during the broadcast, then I will pray for it. I look back at the comments when I'm done and I will pray for it when I see it in the comments. So put your prayer request on the screen right now. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, but that doesn't mean it's not up there. If it's up there, then I will pray for it later. Now, as I tell you every week, when you see me close, uh, close my eyes and I start speaking in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost about healing, deliverance, finances, and if there's any other prophetic words he wants me to release. So let's do that right now. Okay, the Holy Ghost said there need, needs to be healing on eyesight. So anybody that's looking at me right now, if you're struggling with your eyesight, put both your hands on your eyes and say, in the name of Jesus, I command my eyes to be 100% whole. I command the blood to flow. I command every part of my eye to be healed, be healthy, be in alignment. And I command my vision to be 20-20, to be 100% normal. And I command light and seeing and vision to come into my eyes right now in Jesus' name. And if there was a blindness demon attacked in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that demon of blindness and we command sight to the blind in the name of Jesus Christ. And blind, blindness demon come out in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Didn't feel uh, any other leading. So, all right. Amen and amen. Uh, so, again, so happy <clears throat> to share the word of God with you because I'm always encouraged as the spirit of God begins to release. I'm always encouraged. All right, hold on. There's a prophetic word I need to release. For behold, my people, 
You're not waiting on me. I'm waiting on you to allow me to heal you, to allow me to reset your expectations. For if you carry any bitterness or hurt or disappointment or dis disillusionment, it is because of the past. And I am able to give you new days. I'm able to give you a new future. I'm able to give you a bright future. I'm able to give you a future that's more than you can ever dream or imagine. So allow me to come into the recesses of your soul and your heart and let me rebirth inside of you a new picture that will be a new expectation and watch me bring it to pass. For I will bring it to pass out of my great love for you, says the spirit of the living God. Wow. All right. So that might not be easy, might not be easy letting God do, do the surgery on you that he wants to. But that's the only way to get your expectations reset. So I say, let's go for it. Let's bring our hurts and our pains and our disillusionment and our bitterness and our negativity and the parts of us that are broken. Let's bring them to Jesus and let him heal them so God can reset them and we can have a better future than our past has ever been. Amen and amen. So again, so glad to bring the prophetic word to you this Sunday. Um, Pray for me today. I've got a book signing. I'm part of the uh, a literacy event. I'll post more information about that on my personal Facebook and my uh, Prophet David Taylor page, same page this video is on. Uh, remember, if you didn't watch this live, you can always watch the replay on Facebook, uh, Periscope, on my Twitter account, and on YouTube. Okay, and I always put those links uh, right above the video on Facebook. And then those of you that want to sow into my ministry. I've had several uh, people talk to me about that. And thank you for wanting to sow into my ministry. I have my Zelle set up now. So you can sow through Zelle. Uh, and remember, whenever you bless a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. God will give you uh, everything he gives the prophets, which always starts out with increased vision and increased prophetic. So you can always expect that when you sow into a prophet's ministry. So if this word has blessed you, then... Thank you for sowing, you know, to support me, to help me keep it going. So many countries I want to visit, so many more things I want to do. So thank you. God bless you. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about letting the Lord get in there and reset any part of me that's still broken and living those great expectations. And I want you to be excited too. All right. God bless. I'll see you same time next week, next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And remember, you can always watch the replay if you didn't see it live. Okay? God bless. Have a good rest of your Sunday.